Hello, History 363. So today we're going to be talking about the First Punic War. Um, and this is a truly extraordinary war. It's very important for a couple of reasons, mostly because it's the first time that the Romans wage an extended campaign outside of Italy. Um, and it is therefore a huge step towards Rome becoming a truly over a Mediterranean power. Um, it's the first of three wars with Rome's uh, arch enemy, Carthage, um, that will ultimately lead in the, into the destruction of Carthage uh, during the Third Punic War um, uh, in 146 BC. Um, and without question, um, when we think about the big peer rivals that Rome has in the Mediterranean, Macedonia, the Seleucid Kingdom, uh, the Ptolemaic Kingdom, although the Ptolemies are, are largely friendly with Rome, and Carthage, of all those, of all those peer rivals, that is, big, powerful states that have, would te technically have the potential to threaten Rome, Carthage is without question the most dangerous. And the wars with Carthage, the first two at least, um, are the most uh, difficult and lethal for the Romans. So the fact that Rome ultimately defeats Carthage in both the First and Second Punic War means that it dispatches its most dangerous rival, um, and therefore this is a huge step towards Rome's eventual Mediterranean hegemony. Um, this is also the moment when Roman, Rome develops a lot of the capacities that it's going to need to be a Mediterranean superpower, most importantly naval capacities. And of course, to, we'll, we'll talk about the development of the Roman Navy, um, but this build involves not only building ships, but also acquiring the kind of the technical knowledge to man those ships, um, which Rome is going to need if it's going to be conducting overseas operations, eventually not just against the Carthaginians in Sicily, um, but in Sardinia and Spain, in Africa and in Asia and Greece and Illyria. The, you, you, the Romans need a navy if they're going to be a Mediterranean superpower. And up till now, um, uh, they really have not um, had significant naval forces. Um, let's just talk about Rome and Carthage. I mean, it's tempting to see them as, uh, again, arch enemies. Um, but up until 264 BC, the outbreak of the First Punic War, Rome and Carthage are ancestral friends. Um, remember, one of the first things that the New Republic does when they kick out uh, old uh, Tarquinius Superbus and his, his uh, uh, rapist son, um, the first thing they do is reaffirm a treaty with Carthage. Um, which at this point is the most important power in the Western Mediterranean, also a city-state like Rome, perhaps founded uh, somewhat earlier, according to the tr traditional, almost mythological chronologies about, a, about a, a 50 to 100 years before Rome. Um, uh, but uh, Polybius, our source, Polybius, uh, an Achaean historian active in Rome in the uh, 150s BC, claims that he's actually seen this treaty. And so, you know, one thing that is so you know, rare in our sort of part of the, the historical world is we really don't have archives, right? I mean, if you're taking other history courses, your professors who are excellent researchers are probably talking constantly about archives. What, you know, uh, what, what is the archive for a particular question? Going into the archives, finding primary source documents, just waiting for you. We don't have that in, for, in ancient history for the most part. Um, uh, instead, what we have is this sort of secondary research, someone like Polybius, who's sometimes an eyewitness, but is, is not an eyewitness to say the First Punic War. But we know that Polybius in this one occasion has actually gone into the archives, that is the collection of bronze inscribed documents that the Roman Senate maintains, and he's claimed that he's seen some of these really old treaties. In fact, he says the treaty is so old that the Latin is archaic, no surprise, we know that Latin has changed a lot since 500 to 150 BC, that he needs help of sort of certain specialists, probably religious specialists, who have some sense of what archaic Latin sounded like, to help him read it. Um, so we can't get to the archives, but Polybius has gone to the archives, and he says that there's these treaties between Rome and Carthage. Um, the first treaty in 509, which Polybius provides his transcript of, again, we should be cautious, it's a very readable transcript to what Polybius tells us is a very illegible document. But the overall gist of the treaty is Carthage in 509 is the senior power because both sides accept certain limitations. The Carthaginians only accept limitations in a tiny part of Italy, 
namely Latia. So it does acknowledge the Republic's uh, sort of hegemony or sphere of influence over Latium. Um, but anywhere else in Italy, the Carthaginians can do whatever they want. If they want to sack the city and burn it down, they can. If they want to trade, they can. Meanwhile, the Romans accept a lot of restrictions, not just in Africa, where they're not supposed to sail at all unless they're blown off course or encounter some kind of emergency, um, but also in Sardinia and, and Sicily, where there's even restrictions on Roman merchants, more restrictions in Sardinia than Sicily. So the, 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 the area where the Carthaginians place restrictions on is quite large. It's, it's, it probably reflects a very large Western Mediterranean Carthaginian sort of zone. And the area where Carthage accepts restrictions are is very, very tiny, just the little speck of Italy and, and, and Latium, um, which sort of tells you something about the, the relative power of the Roman Republic versus the Carthaginian uh, uh, city. Um, now there is another treaty in 438, um, which still the, there, there, there are the restrictions uh, shift a little bit, but nonetheless there is a real sense that Carthage remains the senior power that actually has uh, again an, an ocean uh, a sphere of influence in the Western Mediterranean, um, uh, whereas Rome uh, uh, still is largely limited to a, a small part of the Western Italian coast. Now, in 279, Roman Carthage are allies. They fight a war together, um, and that is the war against Pyrrhus, because Pyrrhus is a mutual threat to both. He's a direct threat when he comes into southern Italy. But remember, um, uh, after his frustrations at the Battle of Asculum, um, he accepts the invitation of Syracuse and other Greek cities in western, uh, sorry, eastern Sicily, to help him, uh, to help fight the Carthaginians. And this is actually the traditional dynamic on, on Sicily is the Carthaginians um, and uh, have uh, control, a sphere of influence on the western side of the island where there is a series of Greek city-states, the most powerful being Syracuse on the eastern part of the island. Um, and this has been going on since at least uh, after the Athenian Sicilian expedition um, it's, it's unclear when Carthaginian uh, 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 sort of hegemony in, in Western Sicily begins, but it, it's, it probably is hardening after the Athenians uh, are, are defeated. Um, so uh, uh, in 279, Rome and Carthage are allies. They don't engage in joint operations, except there, there is a moment when the, there is a Carthaginian fleet operating against Pyrrhus and a Roman army preparing to fight him in Italy. Um, not necessarily coordinating, but clearly they are allies and friends. So what that means in 264, when Rome and Carthage go to war, um, it's not like they have some kind of ancient enmity or ancient bad blood. On the contrary, they have a tradition of friendship laid down in treaty after treaty after treaty. Um, um, and, of course, they also have something huge in common. They're both uh, Republican city-states. Um, uh, Carthage, too, like Rome, um, elects two uh, senior annual magistrates called suffets um, uh, uh, and also has a kind of um, a, a Senate-like institution, which the Romans often refer to as the, the Carthaginian Senate, um, and has popular assemblies that do things like elect magistrates um, and, uh, and can uh, engage in some level of legislation. Um, uh, so uh, these are both Republican city-states that may have somewhat similar ideologies. Um, and again, they've been friends for uh, 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 roughly um, you know, over 200 years, um, closer to 250 years. That's a long period of friendship. And yet in 264, they go to war. So what happens? How does this war get sparked? And, and as so often happens in you know, warfare between big hegemonic powers, oftentimes it's small powers or medium-sized powers that end up having a lot of, um, of unanticipated agency. Um, and here the real sort of uh, uh, key power are the Mamertines. Um, the Mamertines are companion Oscan mercenaries, mercenaries who have gone over um, probably actually to uh, 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 you know take take part in the series of wars that are um, uh, ongoing in uh, in eastern Sicily because Greek city states like hiring 
Oscan mercenaries. Um, uh, and, and, and in some ways, as the Romans conquer the Samnites, if you're a Samnite who's, I don't know, unhappy uh, with uh, uh, this new Roman power, well, what are you going to do? Well, you might say, hey, I'm, I can't really thrive under Rome. I'm going to go seek mercenary service abroad. And, the, and, and Sicily sure has a lot of demand for this Oscan supply. So these Mamertines, sons of Mars, Mamars is the sort of Oscan closely related Mars, war god, um, uh, they after they uh, uh, basically stage a coup. So this, this company of mercenaries or battalion of mercenaries, whatever you want to call it, seizes um, the uh, city-state of uh, Messenia um, right there on the uh, northeastern tip of Sicily. Um, and they actually uh, control it um, for uh, uh, several decades. Uh, basically, a bunch of uh, mercenaries, brigands, condottieri, perched upon this hapless city-state. Um, and one way that they continue to sort of fund themselves is through uh, piracy, brigandage, um, uh, and, um, you know, that's that. Um, now, um, Syracuse, the most, again, powerful Greek city-state, um, led by an energetic um, tyrant who will soon call himself a king, Basileus, hero, um, uh, decides to finally move against the Mamertines. Um, and this is what sets off this whole diplomatic crisis. And the Syracusan army um, really roughly handles the Mamertines. And, and they realize that now their back is against the wall. If they don't get some kind of foreign aid against Syracuse, it's quite likely that they'll be kicked out of their perch in Messenia. So the Mamertines appeal to the Romans. And their, their appeal, which may be disingenuous, is that we too, or all Italians, will you help your ethnic brethren? And here, there is a split. Um, the Senate does not want to help the Mamertines. Um, and it, it's possible part of the split are two different types of policy. So the Senate may be, and here I'm using an analysis that's been proposed by a scholar named David Potter, the Senate may be debating whether to accept an unconditional surrender of the Mamertines, a deditio, as a condition for uh, uh, intervention. And the Senate decides, no, you guys are on your own. Um, however, the Roman people, probably uh, dealing with a, a proposal that perhaps the consuls who would like to have a war so that they can have something to fight in their consular year, the Roman people move uh, to stage and to, to, to authorize an intervention. It's unclear they're actually declaring war at this point. What they may be declaring is to assign Sicily as, or, or Eastern Sicily, as the province of the consuls. Um, and we're told that the consuls, who may already have their consular armies raised up, um, uh, uh, and, and one advantage, if you have your consular armies raised up, you've got all these voters stationed close to Rome. Um, and we're told that the consuls promise the people, who again, may be the either mobilized soldiers or soldiers who are levied and are about to report actually to duty, says, look, if we do this, there could be some really rich loot, some booty. Um, and the soldiers say, well, that sounds good, and authorize, you know, vote to intervene. Again, it's unclear the war has fully broken out yet. So Appius Claudius crosses with a consul, crosses with a consular army, roughly 20,000 men. And I, I would just note, moving 20,000 men anywhere, even, even in today's modern military, is a really hard thing to do, let alone moving them all the way down to the toe of the Italian boot and then putting them on boats and getting them across the strait by the later standards of Roman uh, 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 seaborne warfare, yeah, that's a minor thing, but that already suggests some significant logistical capacities, including the capacity to do seaborne logistics and transport. Um, so in, in some ways, the fact that the Romans effortlessly move 20,000 men into Sicily suggests that they have a really um, kind of intensive, if invisible, um, institutional apparatus, not just the army, but people who can arrange for ships and supplies and, and things of that nature. Um, so Appius Claudius crosses into Sicily. And here, it's, it's, uh, what one thing that has happened is the Carthaginians um, uh, have also responded to a um, uh, Mamertine appeal for aid. The Mamertines are blasting a wide signal. 
Um, and the Carthaginians, of course, uh, you know, they say, look, if, if we accept uh, this, we're going to put a garrison in Messenia. And so now there's like, now, now, as the Romans are moving out, the, the, the Carthaginians have troops stationed in Messenia on behalf of the Mamertines. And incidentally, Carthage responding makes a lot of sense. Carthage is an ancestral enemy of Syracuse. Carthage is always interested in expanding its footprint in, in Sicily. And so the Carthaginians, therefore, um, uh, would jump at the possibility of helping uh, the Mamertines against Syracuse and of getting being able to get troops into Messenia. However, as this consular army approaches, the Carthaginian officer in charge of the garrison of Messenia does something that seems inexplicable. He withdraws, um, and we're told that this withdrawal is he's somehow tricked by the by the Mamertines. It's equally possible that this guy deserves the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, it, it had there been such a thing. Um, in that he may be saying, wait a second, are we about to start a war with our ancestral friends, the Romans? I, this isn't what we signed up for. Maybe I can defuse the situation by removing Carthaginian troops. Um, so he withdraws, and this is much to his personal detriment, because his soldiers, and Carthaginian soldiers actually routinely do this, um, they judge him as a coward, and they crucify him, um, uh, even though they're now outside of the citadel. Um, so now we have a situation where a Roman army has crossed over in support of the Mamertines. There now is a Syracusan force outside of Messenia. There is now a small Carthaginian force, um, and we have a clash of arms. Um, um, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the Romans are successful in defeating both the Syracusans and their Carthaginian allies and driving them away, uh, away from Messenia. Now, at this point, we've definitely got a war, um, uh, regardless of, of when the sort of formal vote has taken place. Um, we've got a war. Um, but right now, for the Romans, the war may be primarily against Syracuse. Syracuse, who just happens to be supported by some Carthaginian allies. Um, uh, uh, that's probably how things go for maybe the first year. Rome subsequently moves against Syracuse, and Syracuse is defeated and surrenders. Um, and in theory, this could be the end of the war. Rome has defeated Syracuse. Syracuse and Carthage have been strange buddies, right? They're ancestral enemies, but now all of a sudden they're kind of allied. But Carthage seems to be deeply alarmed by this sudden massive projection of Roman power into Sicily. Um, and probably the Carthaginians at this point, as they reassess, realize that this Roman intervention doesn't, isn't just against the Mamertines, but may threaten even the Carthaginian position in Sicily altogether. And Sicily is a really important part of, of Carthage's, um, for want of a better word, empire, although we're imposing now a Latin word on Carthage. Um, and so therefore, um, the Carthaginians, who couldn't at this point probably just say, ah, some hostilities, let's patch it over, we'll, we'll keep to our side of the island. The Carthaginians instead decide to deploy um, uh, a huge army, um, probably around 50,000 troops, into Sicily. Um, and the Romans, who also could say, hey, look, we were just trying to help our friends, the Mamertines, out. We've driven off those nasty uh, uh, Syracusans. We've defeated Syracuse. We're cool too. No, the Romans now send two consular armies, roughly 40,000 men. Um, and clearly after this, this small diplomatic dispute has now exploded into a huge hegemonic struggle, as clearly, which both sides clearly see as over control of Sicily itself. Um, so those are, those are sort of my thoughts on the origins of the First Punic War. Again, a somewhat accidental war at the start of 264. The consuls elected probably do not think that the big theater is going to be Sicily. It's an example of how a small power, in this instance the Mamertines, and also Syracuse, um, can actually have a lot of agency in triangulating against great powers, and oftentimes even here roping them into a conflict that probably neither at the start of 264 would have thought was in either's interest. Um, but now, nonetheless, there are large Roman and Carthaginian armies in Sicily, so I think at this point we will, uh, 
uh, cut this video. Um, we, next time we will talk about the First Punic War, and we may even get a little bit into the interwar years. Um, looking at where we are and where we are in the syllabus, I suspect that the Punic Wars are going to take a little longer than I had suggested on the syllabus, and that's fine. Um, so we'll talk more soon.